Tony Blair is the longest serving Labour Prime Minister in British history. Throughout most of those years in power, one man was closer to him than any other. Alistair Campbell was, for ten years, the other man in the room, privy to Tony Blair's innermost thoughts, ambitions and doubts. He occupied a position of unequalled authority and influence. He kept a diary, recording the good days and the bad, the peaks and troughs of political power. Together we could change the face of British politics and change the world while we're at it. I'm finished with these people, he said, absolutely finished with them. And then she's standing there, spellbindingly drop-dead gorgeous in a way that millions of photographs didn't quite get. He pushed at me, threw a punch and then another. I grabbed his lapels and Tony was now moving in to separate us. The sudden death of John Smith left the party stunned and saddened. It's just heartrending news. It's going to devastate everyone who knew him. Uh, he helped rebuild the party. Uh, he brought us to a position where we could have been in power. Alistair Campbell was then a prominent political journalist with strong Labour connections. Amid the sadness, I had two very powerful instincts. One, that Tony Blair would be leader. And two, though we had never discussed it, that I would work for him. Gordon Brown has till now been regarded as Smith's natural successor, but everything changed. And before Brown is persuaded not to run, Blair confides he will. Tony called, swore me to secrecy and said it was pretty certain now that he would run and GB would not. Within 24 hours, Blair and Brown's deal was public. What would follow would be more than a decade of not always creative tension right at the very top. Tony said he really wanted me to do what I could to ensure a soft landing for Gordon. I think Gordon Brown in an act which will win him considerable support right across the Labour Party has certainly secured his own position. Brown's decision to stand aside was welcomed as honourable and principled, but he suspected Blair allies like Campbell were responsible for manipulating this outcome. Campbell is now playing a dual role as an influential Blair cheerleader and a political commentator. Just a week before the leadership contest, he's on a panel grilling the contenders. Do you think That's... you're tough enough to cope with the sort of media onslaught that Neil Kinnock, for example, had to endure? I think it comes with the territory, and I'm entirely prepared for it, indeed expect it. Campbell is not only Blair's confidant, he's also his unofficial advisor, writing what by now is unquestionably his victory speech to the party. Tony asked me to go round to Richmond Crescent. He had a strong draft of his acceptance speech, and we went through it, line by line, honing it, trying to make it sing a little more. And I want to see a community where if it's not good enough for my children, then it's not good enough for theirs and anyone else's in our society. Blair saw that Campbell knew what made the press tick and could use it to Labour's advantage. I said, I'm not sure I'm suited to it. I've got a big ego of my own and a ferocious temper. I can't stand fools and I don't suffer them. I'm hopeless at biting my tongue. He said, I've thought about that, but I still think you're right for it. I'd also had a serious psychotic breakdown in 1986 and worried that the pressures of the job he was offering might lead me down some very dark and dangerous alleyways. He knew all that and said, I'm not worried if you're not worried. I said, what if I am worried? I'm still not worried, he said. 
I had my partner Fiona, my parents and many friends, including Neil Kinnock, pleading with me not to do it. They feared it would take over my life, that I would end up loathing the media. Neil said, it'll be good for Tony and bad for you and the family. I'm totally opposed. You'll hate the crap, the detail, the as you have to be nice to. But when Blair said he planned to dump some of Labour's socialist baggage, like its commitment to nationalisation, known as Clause 4, Campbell was hooked. Bold. I said, I hope you do, because it's bold. I will, he said, and he had a real glint in his eye. He asked me to start thinking about how best to express it. He's begun to make noises during the campaign, which suggests that he does want to have a fairly radical rethink of some of the Labour's sacred cows. Whether it was deliberate or not, I don't know. But he found the way to persuade me, and I told him that I would do the job. He said together we could change the face of British politics for a generation and change the world while we're at it. I called Peter Mandelson, who said he was pleased. He said, I hope we don't fall out, which I thought was a very odd thing to say, but on reflection, maybe not. Tony told me Gordon thought I was hostile to him. I said he shouldn't. When I said after John died that you would be leader, it wasn't a strategic move, it was just pretty obvious to me. Tony said he still believed Gordon was, in many ways, a superior politician. TB said, you will be a key advisor, answerable only to me, part of the inner team with John Prescott, Gordon Brown and Robin Cook. Deputy Leader John Prescott's job from the outset was to get the unions and Labour traditionalists on board. i have been scribbling some thoughts on a slogan for conference. New Labour, New Britain was the best. Met John and tried out New Labour on him. Not overwhelmed, but not totally hostile. I can't believe we're having a great argument about whether we can stick New Labour on a backdrop. New Labour, New Britain. We're changing the party to show we're fit to be trusted to change the country. It's obvious. This is not about dumping or ditching. It's about building and creating. It's about making it clear what we actually stand for as a political party, because the people of this country want to stand clear. But even the architects of New Labour worry that Blair's going too far, too fast. About an hour and a half sleep, Peter M came round about seven and said there's a small chance Tony will end up dead in the water as a result of this. Tony asked me what the chances were that he'd be out of a job if he went through with it. I said, about 10%. I walked up with him. Oh, well, here goes, he said, smiled, and walked on. There was a ballsiness to his enthusiasm, which I liked. This is a modern party living in an age of change. It requires a modern constitution that says what we are in terms the public cannot misunderstand and the Tories cannot misrepresent. We've just had a declaration of war from Tony Blair, who's told this conference that he wants to ditch socialism, ditch Clause 4, and base the policy of the party on a market economy. In other words, a Tory party, Mark II. But most of the delegates regard Clause 4 as a relic of the past. They see Mr Blair as the future, and they like what they see. 